Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Hello, I'm Dan Graboy. I'm the curator of Sound Waves, and I would like to welcome you. Thank you so much for coming to our event tonight. And for those of you who are coming back to Sound Waves, thank you for coming back. It's nice to see familiar faces and new faces as well. As a musician, since I started playing at age 10, I've been playing in groups. And somehow, groups of musicians are able to function together in spite of the fact that human beings seem to often have a very difficult time working together on things, as we've been seeing in the news lately. So I set to wondering, how do groups work? How do we even talk about groups? Is there a way to mathematically analyze what groups are and what does that mean? How do we play together? How do animals function in groups? So we've put this program together to kind of look into group behavior and see how it works. And as always with sound waves, we will end with a performance, in this case, a chamber music group performance. So I'd like to first welcome Tulia DeMars to come up and give us some math. Thank you again for coming. All right, hi everybody. So um, I'm going to be talking about what mathematicians mean when they say uh, groups. And unfortunately, they mean something quite different. They don't actually, they're not actually analyzing groups of people or groups of bees or I guess groups of monkeys that we'll hear about later. Um, they're, you know, as mathematicians do, they, they make everything very abstract. Um, I'm gonna try to briefly relate it to um, what we might actually think of as a group. So one definition of a group might be, a, as Dan sort of suggested, a collection of objects that interact. So I'm gonna just draw a picture of this. So here's my group, and there's a bunch of dots. Those are my objects. Um, and here's how they inter interact. So they're gonna interact with, via this star. So two objects come together and create a third object, okay? And that, star, that third object also lies in the group. Okay, so this seems very abstract, but you should be thinking this. This reminds me of something. What does it remind you of? I'll, I'll give you a hint. Addition of numbers, right? Okay, so let, instead of these dots, why don't I just have a bunch of numbers, so here I've chosen the integers. And instead of this mysterious star operation, why don't I just write plus? So then minus two star three is just minus two plus three, okay? And we see that minus two plus three, we know that equals one. One is also a member of our group. Okay, so this is, to a mathematician, what it means for a, a you know, a group. So a bunch of objects, in this case numbers, and a way that they interact to form another object of them that's also in the group. So let me give you another example, which you, when you first see it, you'll be like, what does this have to do with numbers? And that is symmetries of a triangle. Now to help us understand this, I have made this triangle. I hope everyone can see it. I've labeled the vertices of the triangle by one, two, three, so that we know what position they're in. And so let's talk about what things we can do to this triangle and still keep it right here. Okay, so one thing we can do is we can rotate it, right? We can rotate it again. We can rotate it again. What, what happened when we rotate it three times? We, we just came back right to the same spot. Okay, here's another thing we can do. We can flip it, right? And then we can combine them. How can we combine them? Well, we can rotate and flip and rotate some more and flip some more, okay? So all of these are the objects of our group here are just going to be um, uh, rotations and flips. So I wrote three flips here because if, you th if, if we start here, we have three possible flips. We can do this. Let me see if I can get this. We can do this. And then which one's missing? This one right here. Okay, so there's three possible flips to do, right? And I only wrote, um, I gave you one rotation because, okay, so that's A. 
or alpha. Mathematicians love Greek letters. So, so here's my alpha. I rotate this way. And when I put alpha squared, I mean rotate twice. OK? So, um, and there's one more here that's not so obvious, and, which I've called E, and that is do nothing. So do nothing. So just leave the triangle alone. OK, so these are my objects now, these flips and rotations. And my operation is just do one followed by another, OK? And that's, that also gives me a symmetry, right? If I rotate and flip, this gives me a symmetry of this triangle, OK? All right? Quiz. It's quiz time. OK. I promise to give you no more than two quizzes during this talk. OK, so here are all of my elements. Let's try to answer some questions. What is alpha cubed? So I'm doing alpha, the rotation, three times. What do I get? It's the same as doing nothing, right? OK, there we go. Um, what about beta squared? So beta is flip. flip along the top. So what happens if I do beta twice? Again, nothing, right? Um, ooh, this is harder. OK, let's see if I can get this right. OK, so ba flip. OK, sorry, uh, yeah, no, flip, rotate, and flip. What's that the same as? It's the it's same as rotate twice. There we go, OK? Um, one more. So what if I, what do I have to do here? I have to rotate and then flip. Okay. And this, if I can get this straight, is going to be like another flip. Which flip was it? Hold on. <laughs> it went to, it's, it's a lot harder to do, do right here. Okay. So I rotate and then I flip like this. And my claim is that this is the same as this flip. Right? It's the same as this flip. OK? So, you know, we can play this game. There's one more question I have for you. What, is, what if I do nothing and then I do alpha? So I've done the, here, I've done the nothing and now I do alpha. That's the same as just doing alpha. OK, you guys got 100% on this quiz. <laughs> um, OK. So, oh. here I've written out the whole sort of multiplication table of symmetries of a triangle. So just like a multiplication table from school, you can you know, say, read the bottom line there, delta times beta. Well, that's going to give me alpha squared. So you have a whole multiplication table. Um, so let's just look at what these, both of these examples have in common. They seem quite different, but they actually have some things in common. So one thing that they have is both of these examples have an identity element. So if I look at numbers, 0 is very special because 0 added to anything gives me that number back again, right? If I'm looking at my symmetries, um, well, then I have the do nothing element, right? If I do nothing followed by some other symmetry, it's as though I just did that symmetry. Okay, this is called an identity element. Um, here's another thing they have in common, inverses. So if I have negative 2, what number do I add to negative 2 to give me 0? 2, OK? And um, same for uh, my symmetries here. So if I do rotate once, what do I have to do to get back to 0? I can r rotate back, but that's the same thing as just rotating twice, OK? There's one more which I'm going to skip here. Um, but this is basically what mathematicians call a group, OK? Let me uh, give you, I probably have time for one more example. <laughs> so I'm going to skip multiplication. I want you to think about multiplication. Uh, what I want to talk about is a clock, OK? Um, instead of, so this is a clock. And instead of 12, I'm going to write 0, OK? And I want, and so now all my elements are just the numbers from 0 to 11. My operation is addition, except you know, if it's 2 o'clock plus 3 hours, I get 5 o'clock. If it's 10 o'clock plus 4 hours, I'm at 2 o'clock again. Okay. So let me maybe uh, finish. I, I just have time? Okay. 
I thought you said 10, that was 10 minute mark. No, okay, good. <laughs> okay, well then we have time for another quiz. How about that? Okay, so this is gonna be the six hour clock quiz. Okay, so three plus five. So I have to look at three. I'm here and I add five hours. So one, two, three, four, five. I'm at two, right? Okay, try this one. Four plus four plus four. Okay, this is gonna be a little bit more painful. All the way to four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, I get back to zero. Okay, let's ask about inverses. What is the inverse of two? So what do I add to two to give me zero? Four, and you know, probably, I wonder how many of you guys are cheating because you can sort of see the answer there. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, Okay, so this is the addition table for the six hour clock. Again, you know, just like a usual addition table. Let's compare these two. So I have chosen two groups that have six elements each, and I've written out their multiplication tables, or a, you know, addition multiplication. And I'm, I'm asking, are they the same? Well, you look at these and you say, well, no, they're not the same. There's numbers in this one and there's Greek letters in the other one. Okay, so let, let's, let's level the playing field a little bit. Um, so we're trying to ask whether they're the same, so they're the same if they have the same multiplication tables. So now what I've done is I've replaced, uh, I've replaced the letters, uh, sorry, the numbers and the Greek letters with just A, B, C, D, E, F, okay? So now, now it's easier to try to compare them, okay? So we look at them and say, are they the same? They're still not the same, but you know what? We'd have to double check. Maybe there's some way I can write these guys, you know, rearrange the order to get the same multiplication table. So unfortunately that's false in this case, so there's no way to reorder these elements to make the tables look the same. These groups are actually different. Okay, so let me just finish that. Um, Applications of these kind of groups might have nothing to do with bees or monkeys, but they have, they're seen all over mathematics. Um, cryptography uses groups. Uh, chemistry and physics uses groups. Even music theory uses groups. And my last slide is a picture of a very famous mathematician, Galois, who actually is the one who coined the term group for mathematics um, in a letter the day before he died in a duel at the age of uh, 20. So he's the one who we have to thank for this. And that's it, no more quizzes. <laughs> Greetings. Uh, I'm Henry Hagedorn. Can I have a thing for myself? Can I wear one? Um, and um, years ago, when I was here in the 60s, I was uh, working with honeybees. Um, and then in my later life, I've been working with mosquitoes. But all along, I've been an entomologist of one kind or another. Um, and what I wanted to talk to you about was group behavior in um, a honeybee. And it's, it's a rather, um, how do I get this started? It's up there. Oh, yeah, okay. Ready to go. Um, involved dance that they use to communicate with one another. So I want to show you the dance first. This is not the first, there's the first one. Okay. Honeybees have some fascinating abilities, among them being able to communicate by performing a unique dance. It informs hive mates where a newly discovered food source is located. Every cycle of this waggle dance roughly describes the shape of the 
take a rate. Let's rewind in a bit more detail. The B on your wagon was on the part of the thread. The straight run indicated here by the wave line. The secret lies in the direction of the straight run, or to be more precise, in the angle between the straight run and the perpendicular, which in this case is 90 degrees to the left. This tells the other bees that food is available 90 degrees to the left of the sun. If the angle is 60 degrees to the right, they'll be flying 60 degrees to the right of the sun. So you got the sun and you will find, um, find some flowers. But the bee dance is a lot more complicated than that. It tells you a lot more than just those, that one piece of information. Um, that you need to fly in a certain direction. It also tells you how far to fly because um, the, the, the waggle part of the dance can be short, which means it's a very short distance to the flowers, or it can be uh, that had glass walls so that he could see the dancing bees inside and follow their dances and, and then relate that to where they went. Um, but what he decided to do was to take a comb out of the um, observation hive. And uh, he held it, and there were bees dancing on it, all right? And they were doing what they were supposed to do. They were dancing um, up toward the direction of the sun at an angle to tell where the bee to go, the following bee. Then he took the comb and flipped it like this. What do you think would happen? Any ideas? The bees got all disoriented, but when he looked carefully, he discovered that they were actually pointing directly at the source. Instead of converting that from the position relative to the sun, it was now saying, go fly that way, and that's where you'll find them. And as he turned around, they kept on pointing that way. Even more interestingly, if he put this experiment in a dark hive um, like this, except there was no view of the, of the sky, they got all confused. Uh, but if he showed them a little patch of the blue sky, they could figure it out. They didn't have to see the sun. They just needed to see the blue sky. Anybody have an idea about how that might work? How could the bee determine where the sun was just looking at the blue sky? Shadows, <laughs> hmm? writing, the brightness. the brightness, okay, yes, pattern of polarization, pattern of polarization. that's a scientist talking over there, <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right, if you look at the, the um, skylight um, with a polarized uh, thing like you have in your sunglasses that blocks a polarized light, um, and you turn it, you'll discover that the skylight is different in, in different regions of the sky indicating where the sun is. So this is really cool. Very simple little thing that he did. Um, the other things that, uh, that the dance tells the following bee who's following the dance, uh, first of all, the bee has an odor. And that odor came from the flower that it was just uh, visiting. And so the bee can, uh, that, that's following, can uh, tell where, uh, what, what kind of flower to search for by the odor of, the, of the, uh, the bee. The dancing bee will also give little samples of nectar to uh, the following bees. And uh, that tells them how much sugar there is, and that tells them how important it is to go look for this uh, bunch of flowers. And in fact, the bee who's doing the dances, dancing will do it much more vigorously with high sugar concentration uh, in the nectar. And also, if there are an awful lot of flowers out there, then it just really goes at it for a long period of time, dances and dances and dances. Um, but if it's not so excited, it just does a couple dances. Um, there is a, a way to stop a dance. This is kind of interesting uh, that, in fact, there, there might be reasons for, um, for the, the following bee to go out and discover that it's not what it's supposed to be. Like, for example, the bees stop producing nectar. Uh, sorry, the, the honey is no longer in um, the, sorry, the flowers stop producing nectar. So, or 
uh, the bee comes to the flower and there's a spider there and uh, uh, or a praying mantid that tries to grab it or a scientist who comes along and tries to pinch it and that's how they did these experiments they pinched the bee and when the bee then was frayed um, scared by something it would come back to the colony and when it saw a, a bee that was dancing it would bump it it would butt it and then it would do something else Sorry, a didn't work. Okay, now if you could hear the buzz over that, it, this thing duplicated like I was afraid it was going to do. Can't even stop this thing. <laughs> okay, sorry. It duplicated itself. It did the movie and the, and the sound at the same time. But you heard that buzz sound? So the, the bee who got scared out there in the field looking at the flower came back and saw that there was a bee dancing for that place. And he goes up to that bee, bumps it, and goes, buzz, buzz, buzz. And that bee stops dancing. So this communication is not just one way. It can be two way. The bee that follows the bee dancing and learns something about what's going on out there can come back and say, hey, this isn't so great anymore. Um, the bee also uh, learns other kinds of things, um, but it's been shown in a number of experiments that oftentimes the bee following the, uh, a, a dancer does not actually do what the dancer tells them to do. Instead, instead the bee can just go out and um, search for flowers that contain the right, that have the right odor instead of going in the right place, they just go anywhere and try to find the right odor. Or they may remember a dance, sorry, remember a, a field of flowers that they had been to in previous days. And so instead of following the dance, they just go right out and go right to the place they had been where the flowers were great. Um, and it turns out that in temperate environments uh, where these kinds of experiments were being done, only about 10 to 20 percent of the bees actually follow the information of the dance. The rest of them totally ignore it. However, if you go into the tropics where the flowers are very, very different from fields of flowers all over the place, instead you've got a tropical environment with a few trees with flowers in them that have only flowers for a short time, then um, it's very important that the bees follow the dance, and they do. So in the tropical environment, if all these experiments if von Frisch had not lived in Germany, but lived in the, um, South America uh, in some tropical air environment, he would have discovered something um, that was valid and never ignored. Now there's another way in which bees do dances and um, don't ignore the information. They pay a lot of attention to it, and that's when the, uh, the bees swarm. What happens when the bees swarm is there's a lot of bees in the colony, too many bees. And so they make a new queen. And then half the colony flies away from the, um, half the bees in the colony fly away with the old queen, leave the new queen, queen behind. And they land in a place that um, looks like that. And you have the, maybe you've seen this, this hanging in a tree. Um, and those bees do dances on the surface of the, um, of the, of the swarm. And, um, then they, why are they dancing? Why do you think they might be dancing? Well, they're looking for a new place to live. And so they, they, um, they will go and search for places to live. This guy here, Tom Seeley at Cornell, um, did some really interesting experiments where he asked the question, uh, how they decide how these bees decide that they um, uh, should go to a particular place. In fact, usually there are a number of places that they could go to. So how do they choose the one to go to? So it, it looked something like this, where initially, early in the day, uh, they found a couple of places. And there are only two of them in this case. And some bees are dancing to one of those. These guys here are dancing over here. And that dance indicates a, a nest over there. 
and some bees are flying back and forth and looking at them. Over time, um, the bees that are dancing here um, are fewer in number, and more and more bees are dancing to that place. And eventually, uh, all the bees are dancing to that place, and that's where they go. The bees that are doing this are called scout bees, and they tend to be the kind of hyperactive bees, like some of your kids are. And um, they um, are the kind of bees that are just ready to go out there and try and find some place right away. Uh, but any bee can be part of the team that looks for um, a new nest. By following a dance, they can become part of that team. Here's a history that Tom Seeley um, determined, looking at um, the different places that the bees had discovered as possible new nests. And there were a number of them. And a lot of them were saying, the best place is over here, number A. Um, and that is indicated by the, the width of the arrow. And how far it is is indicated by the length of the arrow. There's a short one. This is a long way away. So these two, these three sites here seem to be the best in the, in the early part of the, right after the swarm landed. A few hours later, still a lot of sites, and they're changing their minds. Um, there's a site over here that's suddenly new. There wasn't over here. And um, it's got a fair number of adherents. This one's gotten more important. That still is important. That one is getting more important than it was. And so on. So over the period of time, these bees are dancing to different places, and more and more bees are becoming interested in different sites by the vigor of the dance, by going there themselves and looking for, uh, to see what they think that site looks like. And it keeps on going for a couple of days until finally, a couple of days later, uh, all of the bees are dancing to one place, and then they take off, and they land there. Sometimes, however, they can be in a situation like this, where you have two different sites being shown, and they're persistent. Every, these guys, blue guys, are really persistent. They think it's great, and they're not going to go that way. And in that case, the swarm can leave and try and go off in two different directions. But there's only one queen, and it's gone with one of them. And so they all come back to the place where they had been, and they sit there and talk some more. And, and they think about this a little bit more, and they finally eventually leave. Um, so how do they decide? Well, Tom Seeley um, concluded that this dance is, is a very key feature to finding a new nest. They, they don't ignore it. Um, and that we could learn a lot about cooperative decision making, like in Washington. And one bee, for example, uh, some senators could decide um, could take part in, in this decision by searching for a nest and dancing. And in this way, it's looking for a, a broad set of alternatives. So you have a lot of senators all thinking about different things, but they're communicating. They're telling each other about how exciting this, this uh, new bill is going to be compared to that bill. Um, and then they get more uh, of their uh, other senators interested um, in, in this bill, and the, that senator and these senators think, well, maybe a little should be changed a little bit. So they decide for themselves by these dances, uh, by going to look at the quality of the of the new nest to figure out how how good it is, and finally a quorum is reached where everybody is convinced, and um, so they they finally decide. Paul von Frisch called the bee dance the Tanzsprache, uh, which means a dance language. And he received the Nobel Prize in 1973 for that discovery. Wikipedia, good old Wikipedia, defines language as a system of symbols with a set of rules, which we call grammar. So do you think the bee dance is a language like we have? How many say yeah? Wow. <laughs> How many say no? Why not? What? It can't express ideas. Can't express ideas. Can't express ideas. That's an interesting response. <laughs> um, I would say that there is a grammar to this language uh, in the sense that uh, a lot of what I've been telling you about 
the, the dances indicates that it can be changed. It can mean different things, and um, that uh, the bees can respond. And in fact, I suspect there's a lot more grammar to it than we understand because we're not actually li listening to it. But it's a good, it's it's a reasonable debate about whether one should actually call this a language or not. But it's pretty close to uh, the kind of language that we use normally. Now that's a photo of me, 1967. I was at the uh, University of California, Davis, and I was a student there, and I was teaching a course in bee biology, and I was already interested in swarms. And uh, one of the things you can do uh, with a swarm is you can um, take the queen and put her in a little cage, and I put it right between my, my lips. I held the, the cage on a little wire, so it was hanging down. And that swarm then smells the queen uh, from a distance away and comes toward the queen. And all, they all land on it like that swarm you saw in that picture hanging on a tree. So they're hanging on my chin just like that. And so I guess I was being kind of crazy. <laughs> But I, I guess I wanted to prove to my wife that it was courageous. So thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Hi, so I'm Brian Daniels. I'm coming just from upstairs in the Center for Complexity and Collective Computation, where we are very interested in group behavior. And specifically, we're asking questions like, are there simple rules, uh, simple ways to describe the rules that give rise to the behavior of large groups? And so I'll start just with a, a cool example that I found online. So here's someone on their honeymoon uh, recorded the behavior of these um, fish swimming around in a shallow water. And you can see that the small fish are sort of being repelled by the big fish. And if you watch for long enough, you start to realize that, um, uh, right, it's not just that the small fish are, can see the big fish and try to avoid them, but they're actually communicating amongst themselves to uh, communicate various dangers like this bird that's coming up. <laughs> so that's fun to watch. And so we're interested in questions like, um, how does information spread throughout the group, right? Uh, much like the bees, the bees are certainly transmitting information amongst themselves. So how does that work? And how does it lead to larger group behavior? And so one field that knows a lot about spreading is uh, epidemiology, specifically if you're studying infectious diseases. Um, you're going to know a lot about spreading. So here's a simple example. So suppose I have some disease um, that on average, if, if I get this disease, I will infect two other people. OK, so maybe I infect two people. Each of those people, maybe one of them infects three others, one of them infects one other. And you can see where this is going. This is going to explode. Okay. The number of people with the disease grows exponentially, and this infection can spread throughout the entire population. Now let's contrast this with a case where we have a less infectious disease, maybe one that infects on average 0.5 other people. So now even if I start with a lot of people that are infected with the disease, uh, maybe only two of those spread the infection to a few other people, and one other gets infected from, uh, from one of those people, eventually this infection is going to die out, and it's not going to spread through the population. And so if you think about this for a minute, you see that this number, the average number of 
people that I that a single individual will infect is an important number. And epidemi it's so important in epidemiology that it actually has a name called the basic reproduction number. And so my examples then uh, tell you that the group behavior, how many uh, individuals end up infected with this disease is exquisitely sensitive to this simple measure, this R naught, as they call it in the field. And so if this R naught is less than one, if I'm on average infecting less than one person, then the infection will eventually die out. But if it's more than one, it will eventually spread. And so there's this critical value of R naught above which uh, things start to get really bad. So let me give you an example of how this idea is used in our own research. So we have this access to this great data set uh, with detailed information about the social behavior of a group of macaque monkeys. And specifically, we're interested in the uh, conflicts that happen among this group of monkeys. So we have uh, data from 48 macaques. And these macaques are involved in conflicts. And we measure a bunch of those conflicts. And so one of the things we're interested in is how often do these conflicts get really large, or do they stay, basically stay small? And so here's a plot that shows you uh, how often fights of different sizes happen in our macaque group. And so you can see that a lot of the fights are small. So a lot, of, so say two, three, and four there account for a lot of the fight, a lot of the fights that we measure. But some of them, just a few of them, maybe one or two, get up to size 10 or 20 or even higher. So what explains this? Why do we have sometimes the fights stay very small, but occasionally they grow to be to take over almost the entire population? Well, we can use this knowledge that we have from models of uh, infectious disease to try to answer this question. So specifically, we can take a model that just says that if I'm aggressive and I'm fighting with you, maybe that aggression spreads to you with some probability. And in fact, we can use the same measure, this R naught, this basic reproductive um, number to to quantify how fast does that spreading happen. And what we find is that these models actually work very well to describe how large fights get among monkeys. So here's the prediction from the model if we, for the, for the fight sizes, if we have an R naught of about 0.6. So notice that this is below this critical value of one. So fights are not generally going to spread throughout the entire population, but it's sort of close. And so uh, that tells us a lot about what might happen, say, if um, more aggression were added to the group. And we can even play around and say, well, what if we have different r naughts? What would that distribution look like? And so we get a lot of information from this very simple measure of, that simplifies everything down to a single number. So we've talked a lot about contagion as a way of describing behavior of groups. So I'm going to switch gears now and talk about another interesting topic, and that's uh, synchronization. So another th thing that can happen in large groups is that they be can become synchronized. And so we'll start by talking about jet lag. OK. So uh, jet lag, of course, when you, so many of you may have experienced this. If you travel to a far, um, a far distance in a plane, you can find yourself in a case where your body's internal clock is different than the local time. And so you'll be awake at 3 AM when your body thinks that it's 3 PM back at home. OK, this is. Right, a first world problem. Uh, uh, right, my planet's rotation doesn't adjust to my sleep schedule. And so, what's happening to this poor woman who has jet lag? 
Well, it turns out that there's a, a small bundle of neurons about the size of a grain of rice uh, that contain, is called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, and it sits right behind your eyes. So all of you have one of these, and it contains about 20,000 neurons that uh, constitute your biological clock. And it tells you, it tells the rest of your body through hormones that are secreted, uh, what you should be doing at various times during the day. So when it's nighttime, you should be sleeping, then you start to feel tired. And when it's lunchtime, you start to feel hungry. But it, and it is this thing that gets tricked when you have jet lag. Okay, so what do we know about this bundle of neurons? We know that it should act like a clock. That, so somehow it has to oscillate, it has to repeat itself every 24 hours. And we know that we know eventually you get over jet lag, right? So you must be able to somehow adjust to match the time of day. So this clock adjusts itself automatically. And how it does this is known. And it does this by, um, by looking for cues from the sun. So if you see a bright light, uh, then it's assumed that it's day. And so if your internal clock uh, detects that it's behind, then it will speed up. Or if it detects that it's ahead, then it will slow down. And this is a measurable effect. And it, so this kind of synchronization, so your internal clock is synchronizing to the time of day, is called we, what we call entrained synchronization. So your internal clock is just adjusting to match some master clock that exists out in the world. And it's measurable. So if so, one experiment you can do is give bright uh, is expose people to bright lights at weird times of the day. So if you say see a bright light just before when you think it's going to be dawn then your clock will adjust itself, it will speed up to try to match the new, uh, the new cycle. And similarly, if you shine a bright light just after when you expect it, it will slow down. So this is a simple explanation for how that clock works. And it makes sense. But the real surprise comes when you look closer at how these neurons are working. So remember, we have 20,000 neurons that have to work together to make a collective clock that has these properties that it will oscillate once every 24 hours and that it can be adjustable. And if you look closer at these, the surprising fact is that uh, every one of these neurons is its own clock. So if you take one of these neurons out, uh, it will oscillate with some uh, period that's close to 24 hours. But in fact, there's a lot of variability. So uh, some of these neurons will oscillate, say, with 22 hours, over 22 hours. Some will oscillate over 26 hours. So there's a large amount of variation. There's a lot, also a large amount of noise at the individual level. But somehow these all come together to make this very stable oscillation that's almost exactly 24 hours. So how does that happen? And notice that it has to happen too, even if you can't see the sun. So even if there's no master clock, uh, if I put you in a dark room or a cave for a few days, you'll still have your 24 hour oscillation. Maybe eventually you'll get sort of out of sync with the outside world, but you'll still be at about a, that rigid 24 hour cycle. So how does this happen without that master clock? Well, it turns out there's not just something called entrained synchronization, but also spontaneous synchronization. So what if these cells can now communicate with one another? Can they all decide, come to a consensus on the correct time of day. And it turns out you can. So I'll give you a couple examples uh, from other systems of how this can happen. So here's a fun example. 
So here I have a set of metronomes, five metronomes, each of which is clicking at a slightly different rate. And so they'll just go on clicking at different rates. But if I put them all on a board, I'm going to set that board on top of two uh, soda cans, then the motion of, that, of the metronome can affect the other metronomes in a way that they can eventually synchronize with one another. OK, so here they're all just doing their own thing. Now you see just by these minute little corrections, they're communicating with one another. One guy is still a little bit off. There we go. Okay, and this is a very stable oscillation now. So I could leave this for days and it, it would still stay in synchrony. Okay, and no, notice there's nothing, there's no outside source that's providing the, that's telling them when to click, but they're just coming to consensus on their own. So that's called spontaneous synchronization. And that's how um, this little bundle of neurons works to create uh, a very stable 24-hour cycle. And so that's all I have time for today. But I'll end with one more, um, one more demonstration. Hopefully this will work. So it requires all of your participation. So um, what we're going to do is try to form a spontaneous synchronization. Okay, and so when I say go, you're all going to start clapping at whatever rate you feel is correct. And then you're going to start listening to your neighbors and see if you can all come to consensus and start clapping in synchrony. All right, I've never tried this, so let's see if it works. <laughs> Everybody ready? Okay. One, two, three, go. Very good, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, you can put the screen up now. Thank you very much. I have to say, well, we have such brilliant mathematicians and scientists here who know so much about our world. I was actually you stole my thunder. I was going to see if we could clap in synchrony for them, but now we've done it. So, <laughs> so you are a music student, and you have a dream. And your dream is to play in an orchestra. And the reason that's your dream is, number one, it's fun. Number two, it pays. You could throw in number three, it's prestigious, but really fun and it pays. That's a kind of a motivator right there for a musician. Not that many things actually pay. So what do you do to train to win a job in an orchestra? So to win a job in an orchestra, you need to play an audition. And this is something that you do by yourself on a stage, usually for a group of people who are in the orchestra who are sitting behind a screen. So you essentially go to, say, Orchestra Hall in Chicago, and you walk out on stage, and you're all alone, and you don't see a soul. And you play a bunch of solos alone from the orchestral repertoire for your instrument. And the winner wins the job. And what do they do in their job? They sit on stage with 93 other people, and they try to play exactly together. So is this system crazy? Well, it probably is crazy. Some of you have read about this, and you say it's crazy. I might, I'm not sure where I stand. I might argue that, as some people say about democracy, it's the worst possible system except for all the others. <laughs> At least it has a certain fairness. So let's think about what is being, what are we testing for here when we put a person all alone on a stage playing music that's supposed to be played with other people? What could you be listening for if you're one of the people behind the screen? 
So there's a bunch of things you could listen for. You could listen to their sound. You could listen to whether, how well they play loud and soft, which is called dynamics. You could listen to how well they play in tune. But there's one thing that's more important than anything else when you're talking about taking 93 musicians and having them function as one. And that thing, of course, is their feeling for time. Because if everybody's feeling the time together, then this orchestra is going to work, or chorus, since we have our choral director here, it's same for chorus. If everybody is delivering their part with the same feeling for time, for where the pulse is, then it's going to be together. And this has become kind of an obsession, at least in the American orchestral world. So you'll have a first round of an audition, and there will be 115 musicians who are auditioning. And, in the and we need to take those 115, and we need to get down to about eight. So if I'm on, back behind that screen, they start playing their first excerpt of music, and I go like this. And I'm tapping. Once I feel their tempo, I tap along. They can't see me. And I see if they stick with me or not. And usually, if they stick with me, I'm pretty satisfied. I'm like, OK, you've passed the big hurdle. We'll move you on, assuming you didn't miss a ton of notes or anything like that. So I know that you can function in rhythmic synchrony with everybody else. Second round, other things may be listened to. Maybe I'll listen more to your sound. I'll listen more to what you do musically, maybe. But the most important thing to play together is rhythm. And you could call that groove, if you want, feeling for where the beat is. So now you're in the orchestra. Now, here's the problem. You have 93 musicians, and all of them have sat in a room alone for countless hours. And not only have they developed their sense of rhythm and pitch and how to control their instrument, and, but they've also developed their sense of taste, their idea of how Brahms should sound, how Beethoven should sound, how Bach should sound, how Mahler should sound, and how Schoenberg should sound. And everybody is an artist. And everybody is at the top of their profession. Because believe me, it's extraordinarily hard to win these jobs. You have incredible competition. Lots of my guys, my students are over here. They're all going to win jobs. But not everybody wins jobs. <laughs> no, it's very, very hard, as they know. And they work unbelievably hard to try to win one of these spots. And by the time they win it, they, I promise you, are going to be an expert, absolute expert. So now they're sitting on stage. And the first trumpet has one idea of how to play. And the third oboe has a different idea of how to play this piece. And the violins, the violin, first violin section has you know, 19 people in it. And the second violin section has 19 people in it. And so we have 38 people. I think I did that right. And every one of them has a different idea. And yet they need to be synchronized. So how are they synchronized? We have a conductor. So let's think about this now. We have a motivation for people to form a group, be it economic, artistic, social, whatever it may be. There's a motivation. And now in the case of an orchestra, we have a structure of authority. Because without that, as those of you who are academics know, if you put 10 academics in a room, you don't get anything done at all. Because everybody has an opinion. So, in the music world, at least in the orchestral world, we assign somebody to be in charge. And in fact, there are further hierarchies. So in my section, the French horn section, we have a principal horn, horn one. And if horn one, if the music is written, if there are notes that are supposed to be staccato, that are supposed to be short, they have a little, they're notated with a little dot over them. Okay? Now that means short. But what is short? What does short mean? There's lots, there's an infinite length, number of lengths you could play that note. So you could go bop, 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 or you could go ba, 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 or you could go ba, 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 ba. Those are all short. And we all have a different idea of how we want to handle that shortness. So what do we do? We listen to how the principal player is playing, and we adapt, and we do it hopefully a lot faster than this group got our synchrony together. It has to be instantaneous. 
So we train our ears to be able to do that. We work in school. We worked on that last week in our group to be able to instantly adapt to leadership. And there are graphs of, of um, listening and responsibility to adapt that I think would fascinate your group. Because for instance, if I'm playing first horn, I am listening to my whole section. In particular, I'm listening to the person playing the lowest notes in my section, the fourth horn player, because the lowest notes are where we base our our intonation, how in tune we play. It's extremely difficult to tune to someone who's playing above you. We always tune to someone who's playing below us. So I'm listening down to the section at the same time that I'm leading the section. But I'm also listening to the principal trombone player, the tuba player, and the principal trumpet player. Because we're a network within the bigger network. We're a network that has to function as a group, the principal brass players. But I'm also listening to the principal woodwind players. Because the horn, flute, clarinet, oboe, and bassoon form a kind of a quintet that has to be unified. It has to listen to each other. So there's another network. At the same time, I'm listening to the bass section. And it's hard to hear them. They're way over here. I'm behind them. But I have to listen to them, because they're always the lowest of the low. And I have to hope that my fourth horn player is listening to them to tune to them. I'm also listening to them to tune to them. And I'm also watching the conductor. And I'm probably kind of listening to the violins to the extent that I can hear them. Believe it or not, they're quite far away when you're in the back of the orchestra, and they can be difficult to hear. Especially when I'm playing, I can't really hear them. So I have to hope that they're listening to me, too. But at the same time that they're listening to me, they have to function all together. So there's this incredibly complicated pattern of what's happening and who's responding to who that kind of is like those fish. It's kind of like those fish that we saw in your first slide. It happens in flux, and it happens because of great training, and we, we do it voluntarily, right? Just as you voluntarily tried to clap in synchrony. Now, what does the conductor do? Those of us who've played in an orchestra or sung in a chorus, we know very well what the conductor does. And in fact, many people who are not musicians come up to me and say, what does the conductor do? I can't tell. I have no idea. Well, you're going to learn right now because we're going to compose a little piece together, and I will conduct it. So let me explain a little bit about what a conductor is doing with the baton. And I want to say, the baton did not always exist. It's a wonderful invention. Like many inventions, things get streamlined as we learn more and more. So every music student has to take music history class. And there's one thing that every music student remembers from music history class, and they forget everything else. And the one thing they remember is that the French Baroque composer Jean-Baptiste Lully died because in those days, conductors conducted by pounding a stick into the ground. Boom, 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 boom. And he pounded it into his foot and got gangrene and died. <laughs> so we remember that, and we forget everything about <laughs> Frescobaldi and mensual notation and all those kinds of things. But things have evolved now, and we have a baton. Now let me show you what the baton does. So everybody knows that classical music happens in repeated patterns called measures or bars. And every bar has a strong beat, which is the first beat. And then it has a sequence of beats which lead back to the first beat. So if we have four beats to the measure, we have one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one. And our music is very metrical. So if you think, ba dum ba dum ba dee dum ba dum ba dum ba yum bum ba dum ba dum ba dee dee ba dum ba dum ba dum bum sorry about my singing it's terrible I'll improve you anyway so you can tell that music follows these ordinary points now contemporary composers who are very mischievous are often interested in thwarting that and saying we want to explore irregularity right and that uh, I'll show you a little bit about that as well but basically, what you need to know is we have a strong beat, and we lead up to it through the rest of the measure to the next strong beat. And the strong beat looks like this. It goes down. It's often called the downbeat. The last beat in the measure, and this is not brain surgery here, goes up. 
So no matter how many beats in the bar, we end with up, down. Let's look, about, look at what happens when we have two beats in the bar. That's the easiest. Down, up, down, up, down, up, down. Now notice, if I conduct this way, there's no life to that beat. You can't tell where the next beat is going to be. Um, one of my professors told me a story about a con conductor who was conducting a piece, and we have all kinds of conductor stories. If there's a story that denigrates a conductor, we know it, and we tell it <laughs> frequently. So here's the story. The piece he's conducting starts on a downbeat, beat one, and the whole orchestra has to go bop, and he conducts it like this. <clears throat> and the orchestra goes bop, and he says, it's not together, do it again. And he's getting madder and madder, and he says, I'm being very clear. And he's right. He's being very clear, but he's being very unmusical. You, when you watch conductors in performance, John Demain at the Overture Center, our conductors at the UW, and please come to our concerts. We have many of them. Conductors on great performances on TV. It's very hard to be a good conductor, and the motion here leads to the motion here. So I'm going to ask everybody to clap on my downbeat, and I'll give you an upbeat. Let's see if you can tell. Can you see me in the back? I'll conduct high. So we go like this. <clears throat> and that's pretty good, right? Let's do it again. There we go. So you can, if I go like this, do it again. <laughs> you can't tell, right? And if I'm a conductor, I blame you. But it's my fault. It's absolutely my fault. Now let's look at a measure that's in three. We know that one is here and that three is here. One, two, three, one. Yep, two, you can clap on one. One, two, three, one. I'm going to switch to four. One, two, three, up, down. Two, three, you can always up, down. Two, three, up, down. I'll go into five. One, two, three, four, up, down. Right? And no matter, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, there's always an up and then a down. So in terms of transmitting information about pulse, that's what the conductor is doing. But that's not all the conductor is doing, because the conductor wants to control everything, because we are, the conductor is sculpting a performance, so that the group has a group voice, a group entity. Because if all of you, and there's maybe 150, 170 of you out there, if all of you do a different thing, it's not going to sound good. So clap with me. I'm going to give you three, four, one. And I want you to clap on one. And I want to see if you can figure out how I want you to clap. And clap the way I want you to clap. Ready? Exactly. How about this? Right? So there's lots of information. I can do this, <laughs> right? And I can do this. There's information in my face, information in my body, and information in my baton. And where do, you, where do your eyes go when I do this? Right to that baton. It's moving, and it's white, and you can see it, and it tells you what to do. And when you play under a good conductor, and I would say I have played under two exquisite conductors in my career. Two. That's it, because it's so hard to do this well. But my feeling when I played under a good conductor was I knew when to play, I knew how to play, and it felt like it was my decision. And the entire orchestra was together, everybody. That's what a conductor is doing. Now, what about when we play in small groups? What about when we play chamber music? So I would like to invite my colleagues up before we perform. I'm going to move the bees, if I may so that you can all see. Please come look at these bees. They're unbelievable. They're so sweet. And there's a queen with a red dot in there. Can we just slide this maybe out of the way? So as you can imagine, as systems evolve, we tr they tend to evolve towards great efficiency. 
right? So they're able to do lots of things at once. And we don't, we, our complex systems that are too complicated die out, and the systems that work live on. And this system of up-down and of body language with face, it works. And so we adapt it to our chamber music playing. We do the same kind of motions. So if I want to show where a downbeat is with my horn, and this is a round baton. It's also a heavy baton. It's hard, it's hard to conduct with a round baton. In this case, my colleague has a very nice baton to conduct with, the clarinet. And our pianist has his head and his breathing. And we all can use our breathing also to conduct. So let's say we're, we, I want you all to clap on the downbeat. And I'm going to show where to clap by breathing to prepare and using my head. Ready? Get ready to clap. You could tell just by my body and my breathing. I probably don't need to use my body much at all. Let's try this. Ready? Pretty good. Lots of information in the breath. For wind players, that's good news, because that's how we play. We have to breathe in order to play. For string players, you hear them doing all kinds of sniff breaths, and they think they're being like wind players when they do them. <laughs> and, uh, they have a lot to learn from us. So now, here we are, sitting in our chamber music group. And this is very interesting, because now we have a very different power structure. There's no director. So luckily, we have three people. So we can have, as a governing rule, we could have a democracy here. And there's no ties. I think the reason why people in string quartets are often so demented is because they have ties. They can't decide anything. Odd-numbered groups work much better. And we, there's lots that we need to communicate. So when we rehearse, we're, we stop and start and talk about things and discuss them. But also, we try to get as much information communicated on the go. Because economics, we need to be efficient. We don't have years to rehearse a piece. Often, in, I mean, we're privileged here in the academic environment that we can have a bunch of rehearsals. But in, in sort of real life out in the world, you have two or three rehearsals. You've got to get the job done. So you can't sit there like a stump and then talk about the piece every time it comes apart. You need to show each other what's happening. So I want to talk about some of the body and, and instrument cues that we give to each other. And the first cue is basically a cue that says, here we go. Now, what works best in an orchestra with 90-some people is that the conductor gives the cue. But what works best in a chamber music situation where it's not so complex is that we all give the cue together. And with three people, we can synchronize very, very easily. So if we play just an F major chord, maybe staccato, and we'll do that, and we'll all cue it together. And it's just breathing and showing. And again, up, down. And if, I, if we want to play bop, bop, we can't give the cue up because our, neck, our first note is an up. So we have to give our cue to the side, and we'll play up, down. So. so you can kind of tell, even just by watching us, what's going on where we are in the measure. And you can also tell by listening. And we're listening like crazy when we play with each other as well. So we have an interesting, again, an interesting network going on, even within a trio. Even within a trio, we have a kind of a triangular shaped responsibilities where I'm working with Linda, but I'm also working with Kit. He's working with me and also with Linda and so on. So the triangle that you showed us with A, B, and C completely relates to the symmetries that happen within this group. We're also all listening to each other at the same time. Bear in mind that the amount of RAM available in the human brain is limited, which is why musicians have to practice so much. We have to ingrain this stuff into our heads until we can do it properly. And we can also use body language, just like a conductor would, to show how to play. Ready? F major. All the cues that I've shown so far are cues for playing. 
But when we hold something, we want to come off together as well. And there's lots of different ways you can come off, you can end a note. In fact, usually when you're a beginning music student, all you think about is how to start the note. But then later you get to college and it's like, oh my God, I have to figure out how to end this note nicely too. It's getting a little too much here. So if we play our chord and hold it, and then we'll just cut it off a couple of different ways. Bear in mind, we did not set this up. So this is all spontaneous. So hopefully it goes well. So that one kind of pulled off suddenly. The first one tapered. And there's an infinite number of ways that you can do this. So as we perform this piece, and we're going to give you a few examples from it first, watch what our bodies do. Next time you watch a string quartet, watch what their bodies do. They have the, bow, the motion of the bow on top of everything else. So there's a fascinating dance that's a combination of technique, musicianship, and communication. The piece we're going to play is a trio, obviously for horn, clarinet, and piano by Carl Reinecke. German composer, romantic composer. He actually lived past the official end of the romantic era. He died in 1910, but he was writing very, very beautiful, gushy romantic music that you're going to love. So the examples that we've chosen are examples where the tempo, the feel of the pulse or the groove changes, and so we have to communicate what's happening. So um, the first three examples are from the first movement of the piece. And we're playing the first movement and the last movement. The piece is really long, so we thought we would just play two of the four movements. So we'll start at measure 66. Watch what we do. By the way, musicians have a term for when the tempo changes within the piece. We call that rubato. And romantic music, one of its hallmarks is that it has lots of rubato compared to, say, Mozart or Beethoven, where there's much less rubato. Styles evolve. And you can see that it's not huge, but we're communicating with our bodies. OK, our next example also has a place where the tempo backs up. It slows way down and then picks up again. And this is at 190. <laughs> And the motions are subtle, but it, oh, it allows the music to just sort of back up into that ending, which is a beautiful thing that Reinecke composed. There's our next one, guys. 218. This is the end of the movement, and the ends of movements often slow down to settle, and this one settles. Notice, by the way, one cue that I often give and I teach my students to give is a cue that I call here I am. So when I, when I join the music, I'll breathe and give a little motion. I'm joining you right now. And that's not absolutely necessary, but it's very comforting. It's sort of like this move. Can you stand up? Right this way. We're together. <laughs> it's a little bit absurd to see the two of us together. <laughs> it's like, here I am with you. Thank you. You can sit down. I'm feeling short. <laughs>
And Linda gave the most beautiful cut off to that that forced us to taper that note. And that's why you'll see the title of my talk, Make Them Do What You Want. This is the power of body language, is to make your colleagues do what you want while, while being really nice. We're going to start the second movement that we'll play, which is the fourth movement of the piece, and just watch our bodies and see what you see. There's lots of looking, lots of bouncing, all conveying information. We have one final example. Where is it? Sorry. 225, yes. So this is, this is interesting because this is what we call, you, you know, in, uh, in, music, in classical music, almost everything we talk about has an Italian word. So this is an accelerando meaning accelerating. So here we have to kind of goose each other to move this thing because once we get started, we want to stay doing what we're doing. But the composer asks us to move and we really try to use our bodies to get each other to move. So there's this whole repertoire of gesturing that happens. We'd like to play the piece for you now. Feel free afterwards, come look at the bees. We don't, in sound waves, we don't have question and answer periods because we don't want to be here all night and I've already talked all night. But please feel free to ask any of us, scientists, musicians, mathematicians, any questions that you have. Please come back. We have a lot of sound waves events this year. Um, the next one's on November 15th. And thank you so much.